Sveika. Um, aš esu Kamila Stankevičiūta ir šiuo metu studijuoju doktorantūrą iš matematikos ir mašinio mokymo Cambridge universitete. Ir šiandien kalbėsiu apie conformal time series forecasting. Uh, tai yra mano straipsnis, kuris buvo priimtas į NIRPS konferenciją prieš keletą savaičių. Ir jis yra pagrįstas mano magistro darbų, kurį aš rašiau Oksforde tarnui. Ir jam vadovavo mano dabartinį kolegos uh, Dakaras Ahmedala ir profesorą Michaela Vendersha. Uh, well, if that's okay, I will switch to English now because of the complex terminology. And let's begin. Um, So the motivation for this work is the clinical time series forecasting because our lab is very interested in problems in uh, and applications in medicine. And why time series are important is because the patient uh, data is essentially a series of observations over time, both on a small scale and the large scale. On the large scale, um, a patient history, electronic health records is just the patient visiting the doctor at some regular intervals And this data is, uh, can be constructed as a time series. Uh, on the smaller scale, it could be an ICU setting where the patient is admitted to the hospital with some acute problem and the vital signs are being measured uh, at very frequent intervals. And uh, so in both cases, um, in order to make uh, a good decision on how to treat the patient or to predict their survival, we care beyond the current state of the patient. We actually care about the entire history. So when did the condition evolve? How did it evolve? Uh, what are the comorbidities there might be? When did those start and so on? Uh, and uh, we also want to be able to predict the future state of the patient. So this is the forecasting problem. And however, the point predictions given by most models are not enough. Uh, because unlikely scenarios might have adverse outcomes. So for example, if there's a drug which might have a very lethal side effect that might kill the patient, we might want to consider whether the potential benefit is worth the risk of the patient dying. Uh, so it's important to, uh, for the model to be able to tell how uncertain it is about patient predictions. Um, but at the same time, the models might be very confident about their uncertainty about some prediction, but they might be wrong about that. So we want to have some guarantees on the errors that the model makes. So this is a problem that we'll be analyzing. And here's a toy example, a very simple one, which hopefully will explain uh, where does the problem lie. So consider this time series of the white blood cell count of a patient after the patient has been admitted to ICU, and we measure the white blood cell count Uh, every day for some number of days they stay in the hospital. And you see between those, uh, how do I point? those two dashed lines, um, this is a normal white blood cell count range. Um, and so we want to, the patient's white blood cell count to stay between those two levels. Because if the white blood cell count is too high, then that means that there's a leukemoid reaction, which means that the patient is fighting the infection and struggling with that because there, there are too many white blood, cell, uh, white blood cells, which means that the patient might die, so we have to intervene. At the same time, if we prescribe something and drop the white blood cell count to levels that are too low, uh, the patient is more susceptible to future infections, and they're also in a worse position to fight this infection, so we also want to avoid that outcome. Now, if the model is predicting this most, um, And suppose, yeah, that on the second day after the, um, after the, the patient has been admitted to the hospital, we observe a very high white, white blood cell count, which means that the patient has an infection. And the doctor might want to decide whether to prescribe antibiotics or not. And uh, so we produce a forecast for the, for the next five days. And if we forecast just the most likely value, just like a single point prediction, without any uncertainty intervals whatsoever, so just this red line in the middle, this most likely outcome states that uh, actually prescribing the antibiotics, the white blood cell count will normalize because it will stay in the normal range, so everything is fine. However, the adverse outcomes are also possible, and this is actually what the doctor might want to avoid, and had the doctor known all that, uh, they might have changed their um, treatment options, maybe consider the different dose, consider the different drug and so on. So we would like to have a full uncertainty interval 
um, such that uh, there are certain guarantees that the true value will always fall in, within that range. And this might help the doctor to make better informed uh, decisions about the patient treatment. Uh, and this extends to, so we described this medical application, but this extends to many other high stakes time series applications, such as stock data, service demand forecasting, and so on. So it's a very a widely applicable problem. And so, so far, uh, there have been a number of approaches trying to uh, um, address the uncertainty in time series forecasting. And the broad categories are the Bayesian uh, neural networks, this work will consider a recurrent neural networks, which is why it's like there are different models, but uh, you, could, you could have variations on those. So there's a Bayesian approach. Uh, there is a quantile recurrent neural network, uh, state space models, and um, the jackknife-based resampling techniques. So, and they all have challenges. So the Bayesian recurrent neural networks um, model the uncertainty through the distributions and parameter values within the neural network. and uh, this, uh, this is the most mathematically principled way to address the problem because if you can compute those posterior estimates, you, you will have like a very good uncertainty estimate. But the challenge with that is that, first of all, you have to change the architecture. And once you change the architecture, it might perform worse just because you, you changed it. Uh, so it has to be built in because you replace the weight with a distribution describing that weight. And then the exact computation is infeasible. And once you start making approximations, those might be wrong and poorly calibrated. You also depend on good choice of the model priors, which is not always possible. So these are the challenges with the Bayesian approach. Uh, then the next approach is the quantile recurrent neural network, where you try to predict upper and lower uh, bounds directly. So when, when you saw this range uh, here, so you have like the upper and lower bound, so quantile recurrent neural networks try to predict those directly instead of this middle value. And uh, this has the problem that it requires a lot of samples to learn those correctly. And on the other hand, the medical setting has a problem that um, the data sets are usually super small, which is why you can't learn those upper and lower bounds very uh, correctly. And so you don't have any guarantees about whether they, they will be uh, in any way valid. Uh, there are state space models which, uh, or other probabilistic models which combine uh, some recurrent neural, neural network architecture, some other deep learning architecture with a probabilistic model. So for example, a Markov chain. And these do provide the possible theoretical guarantees, but they usually rely on some assumptions. So for example, if you combine it with a Markov chain, the Markov chain has the assumption that the future patient state only depends on the current patient state. On the other hand, a patient might, the future state might depend on the entire history of the patient. So it's, it doesn't matter just what the current condition is, but also when did it develop in the past and so on. And the last approach that I will consider is the work uh, done in our lab last year. So it's the, it models the uncertainty through data set resampling. So you retrain the neural network on uh, different versions of the data set where you kind of omit some examples and the, some ranges within the time series. And these also do provide the possible theoretical frequentist uh, coverage guarantees, but they are very computationally challenging because you have to have like a lot of iterations of the same recurrent neural network. So it doesn't scale to any real world data set. And now we'll work. Um, I, I will cover this briefly. And if, if you'd like more details, I could explain later or feel free to read the paper. But we apply the method of conformal forecasting. Um, so it's, it's based on the, this method called inductive conformal prediction, which is basically a method where roughly you measure the non-conformity score of every example in the training data set, which kind of describes how an example is different from the rest of the data set. And you use those values to estimate, uh, you carry out a procedure which, which derives the intervals in the prediction. And we extended this to the time series setting because the original method was applicable to a single scalar value. So just you could think of it as a single value in the future and we just applied it so it could forecast the entire time series. And this is a distribution-free method. So you don't need any assumptions of what kind of data you're seeing. 
And it also does provide the final sample validity guarantees, with the validity guarantee being that the interval that you come up with, the ground truth, so based, based on the error rate that you pick, so for example, if you pick an error rate of 10%, so that so with probability of at least 90%, uh, the, true the true time series will fall within that upper and lower bound predicted by the method. And it's, it's roughly based on the, this um, uh, kind of uh, construction of the non-conformity score distribution, as I uh, kind of briefly mentioned earlier. So you derive the non-conformity scores from your validation data set and then you apply those non-conformity scores to derive the uncertainty intervals when you predict a, um, and when you forecast the time series. Um, so I'm, I'm omitting a lot of details, but uh, I would, in the interest of time, I'll just carry on to experiments. And so we applied it to both synthetic data and some real world data. So in, th in synthetic data, the benefit is that you can control the properties of your training, of, your, of the data that model is seeing and how does it behave with uh, gradually changing that, uh, properties of the data. So um, as you can see, the, the uncertainty intervals get wider over time, which means that the model is getting more uncertain as it predicts further in the future, which makes sense. And also with the time dependent noise variance, we wanted to additionally show, so that just means that in the time series, the time series get noisy over time. So in addition to, uh, being uncertain because of predicting further in the future, as the time series get noisy over time, the noise level is increased, it, it, the, the, the rate at which the intervals get wider are even higher. So uh, that's what this experiment tried to demonstrate. Um, and then we, we kind of showed, uh, so this is on a slightly different test example, but we kind of showed the failure modes of the other methods. So this is the quantile recurring neural network, which I mentioned predicts the lower and upper bounds directly. So in this case, it's roughly correct, but sometimes it just goes, uh, goes off because like it hasn't, uh, probably didn't have like enough data to learn from. And the dropout recurring neural network, which is kind of a Bayesian uh, recurring neural network approximation, it does come up with the intervals, but they are useless because the actual values do fall outside of the prediction interval. Uh, so this, this, this method kind of resolves those problems. And here you can see some properties as well. So on, on the left, you, you can see the, how the coverage changes as you get more training samples. So with the conformal forecasting RNN, it does get above the required coverage level of 90% uh, with very few examples and it stays there. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the other methods do, don't try to optimize for that. So they, they just predict the intervals, but they, they might not achieve theoretically the coverage that we require. Um, and the quantile RNN kind of depends on having a lot of data. So maybe it will reach the 90% at some point, but you need a large data set for that. And at the same time, uh, the width of the intervals. So as you can see here, the intervals might be narrow, but, and, and these might be way too wide, for example, but like if you get more training samples, those intervals also get narrower over, like with, with more samples. So they get more precise and more efficient. So this is also good. And we also apply this on some real world data sets with different properties. So with a different number of training examples, with the different frequencies and different number of steps that we try to forecast in the future. And as you can see, the conformal forecasting RN kind of does achieve the around 90% coverage that we aimed for, uh, which, is, which is good. And in, in the meantime, the other baselines that we compare to kind of fail, especially here. Uh, because the COVID data set in particular had a second wave in the, in the interval that you had to forecast. And because the conformal forecasting RNN kind of saw, saw examples where it was very wrong, it would just make the interval super wide to try to account for that. While the dropout recurring neural, neural network does not try to provide any guarantees, which is why like it, it just fails on the test cases while having the interval being very narrow. Um, so that's it for the main presentation. And if you have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out to me, like I'll ask them here and then later if your question isn't answered, feel free to reach out through the uh, social media and so on. Thank you. So uh, I see that there are multiple questions, so.
thank you for presentation in such examples uh, usually what bothers me is uh, the assumption of symmetry so how to deal with uh, some asymmetric intervals when, when you do predict that so basically what what you have shown that uh, all all intervals that you do predict in, in this like building with time charts you you, you rely on a symmetric assumption what do you mean by the asymmetric assumption that uh, or depending on your point prediction one one side of your interval could be longer much longer than another side so so yep yep so so in this case this method does kind of provide the intervals are kind of symmetric on both sides so it does uh, because it kind of builds on uh, some method that does predict like the um so so it can build, be built on top of any other model so it's it's one of its benefits is that conformal forecasting procedure can be applied to any method that you have so for example we use the recurrent neural network but it could apply to any other method and so in order to deal with that so you kind of have to make the um kind of the interval out of a point forecast so that's what this method does and that yeah uh, unfortunately it kind of works by by just estimating the critical score and then adding it to both sides yeah yeah so so that might be a huge extension indeed yeah so my question would be is that you mentioned in the like you're having a time series forecasting problem which is well well, it's very you have very different methods but when you do model compare mo different neural model comparison you only concentrate on recurrent neural networks so my question is like what is your baseline because we have simple methods for forecasting well how does these complex methods compares to the simpler ones so because maybe because usually in practice like the simple method is more always better than the complex one so yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I completely agree. One of the one of the things that we also considered is that we kind of that I didn't mention here, but for example, in clinical setting, uh, there's a difference. So I kind of uh, I have some extra slides. So in this case, we try to kind of address this problem between the classical methods usually work like on a single time series, and I developed on top of so you get like a single patient, then you would develop a model from that patient and then produce the forecast for for that single patient, and you kind of however many patient model uh, patients you have you would have like a model for each of them separately and you kind of have no way to leverage the data shared between the patients and in in medical settings this, like in stocks maybe it's it's a bit different because like maybe the stocks are more independent but the patients usually share like very similar biology that you might want to leverage so we kind of also try to the reason why we use recurring neural networks is because it's also it's kind of not only about the forecasting of a single person, but it's also about leveraging the data shared between the patients. And like if the models are very simple, they, they often don't have a way to kind of uh, combine those individual forecasts into some overall model uh, understanding the patients in general. Okay, yeah. do you have any more questions? Do you have a sense of how long it might take for an algorithm like that to be fully implemented and applied in practice, like a medical personnel in a clinic, for example? Um, I think that given the regulation and everything, uh, the actual path um, is, is very difficult between like any model and the practice because clinical clinical settings are very regulated. So it's not like you can really experiment with those models and so on. They have to go through a similar approval process as as any medical device would so it has to technically go through a clinical trial in order to be implemented in the hospital so one part of my research personally i think it's it's one thing to publish papers applied in medicine but it's way of a different beast to try to implement those in real life that's something I might want to do after my PhD, actually. But I think it's it's not that simple to publish. Um, to it's simpler to publish a method, but like it, it's very far from being applied. Yeah. 